Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. This is a story about the people who came sailing across the ocean. It's a story about a long and perilous journey of upheaval which came to change populations and influence politics, trade, culture, religion and entire societies. It's a story about the Vikings and how they transformed the world. For most people, the Vikings are seen only as plunders and pirates. But is that the whole truth? Le processus de conversion de la Scandinavie au christianisme, c'est une longue histoire. De var väldigt skickliga handelsmän och delvis för att de kunde förflytta sig. They're going abroad to take what they seek. In this series we will dig deeper and gain more insight into who the Vikings really were. And the truth turns out to be surprising. In the late 700s, the Scandinavians set sail across the seas, searching for a better life, looting and pillaging, eventually becoming what we know as the Vikings. Using their longships, the Vikings began wreaking havoc along the coasts of the Frankish Empire, sacking villages as well as monasteries. But even though the Vikings quickly became notorious for their violent raids abroad, their first attacks on the Franks were not very successful. The Frankish defenses built by Charlemagne were simply too effective, and the Franks were able to prevent the Vikings from sailing up the great rivers and advance further inland. So how were the pagan Vikings able to push into Christian Francia? In order to answer that, we have to find out more about Charlemagne and what happened during the very first Viking attacks on Francia. Charlemagne is a key figure in medieval European history and one of the most influential rulers the continent has ever known. His empire consisted of not only what is today France, but also present-day Western Germany, Northern Italy, Switzerland and Austria. So the Emperor Charlemagne was uh, an incredibly powerful ruler and during his reign he greatly expanded uh, the borders of his empire into the north, towards the area of southern Scandinavia, what we now refer to as Denmark. Han var väldigt angelägen om att sprida det kristna budskapet och att ena riket. Och det togs inte väl emot av en del av vikingarna för att de hade ju sina trosuppfattningar. De ville inte bli pådyvlade någon kristendom av någon annan bara för att han var kung. Vad man trodde på, vilka gudar man trodde på, det var ofta var ens en sak. Det var ingenting som en överhet hade med att göra. And it's been suggested um, that the way in which he did this, not only um, undertaking military conquest, but also in seeking to convert large numbers of people to Christianity. 
at the point of a sword. Which has even suggested to have resulted in, in large-scale massacres. And it's been suggested that this somehow generated um, the perception that there was a need um, for a strike on the Christian world from Scandinavia. And in this, the early Viking raids have sometimes been presented almost, for want of a better term, as a, a pagan crusade. And I certainly don't feel that this was um, such an important factor in that sense. What we have happening at this time in Scandinavia is that society is changing greatly and there is a number of, of social and political, um, economic and ideological factors at play here. Um, but I'm not sure that Charlemagne's actions in expanding his empire really did provide the, the primary impetus um, for these raids. Charlemagne was known for his strong Christian faith and he wouldn't tolerate any pagans in the Frankish Empire. In fact, he repeatedly tried to convert other nations to Christianity by force, including the pagan Saxons, whose religion had strong similarities with the beliefs of the Vikings. For example, the most important religious symbol of the Saxons was the sacred tree Irminsul, which can be likened to the tree Yggdrasil, an important symbol in the Norse religion of Scandinavia. Et la frise était déjà à cette époque euh, en lien assez étroit avec le Danemark à travers les échanges commerciaux en particulier. Donc c'était un voisin très proche du sud de la Scandinavie. Au cours du 8e siècle et jusqu'au début du 9e siècle, on voit aussi la Saxe euh, qui euh, aussi conquise et inclut au royaume franc. Et donc dans ces, dans ces deux cas, aussi bien en Frise qu'en Saxe, euh, on a des territoires qui, qui n'étaient pas chrétiens, qui maintenant deviennent des territoires francs et christianisés. For a long time, the Frankish Empire had suffered constant raids from the Saxons. But around the year 772, Charlemagne decides to strike back and attacks Saxony. This time, he doesn't only want revenge. He wants to force the Saxons to convert from their pagan beliefs to Christianity, once and for all. Charlemagne's servant, a scholar and a monk by the name Einhard, wrote the Frankian emperor's biography, the Vita Carole Magni, Life of Charlemagne. In this biography, Einhard writes, the last war that Charles undertook was against those Northmen who are called Danes, who first came as pirates and then ravaged the coast of Gaul and Germany with a greater naval force. He was of course talking about the Vikings, Le début des activités vikings en, en France, euh, on ne peut pas franchement dire que ça a été euh, un succès euh, aux environs donc de, de la fin du 8e et début du 9e siècle. Et c'est en grande partie, à mon sens, 
à cause d'un pouvoir euh, politique fort en place euh, à ce moment-là, donc euh, avec, euh, avec Charlemagne, qui, contrôlait, euh, qui avait un contrôle militaire bien établi. Instituted a system of coastal defense on the Frankish coast. He put in place not only orders to construct ships to deter seaborne pirates, but he also installed a, a coast guard system. A system of armed groups who would watch for threats coming from the sea, and their job was primarily to stop uh, those forces um, on the beach, as it were. beginning of the 9th century, the system seemed to work quite well. In 820, we have a fairly small Viking raid on the Frankish coast. The Vikings make several attempts to enter uh, Frankish waterways, uh, to plunder, and each time they are thrown out, essentially, uh, by this Frankish coast guard. When the Vikings now start attacking Francia, Charlemagne, who has fought extended wars against people belonging to other religions, is determined not to let plundering pagans into his country. The setback of the first attacks leads some Viking chiefs to simply leave the Frankish Empire and focus on easier targets. The Danish king Gudfred is one of these powerful men who gives up on Francia and heads for other destinations. Other Vikings decided to go a different route. Fred's younger brother Halvdan, for instance, chooses not to follow his brother's example and instead aligns himself with Charlemagne, becoming the Danish envoy to the Frankish emperor. For a while, it almost seems like the violent Viking attacks on Francia have ceased for good. During this time, the Vikings quickly become known in Europe as bloodthirsty pirates, pillaging and looting whenever they are able to. Their far-flung journeys outside Scandinavia also lead to an increase in trade. It was also so that in flood meetings or where land and sea met, in good communication leaders, there was gathered a man for handel, and so soon it grew up to form different trade places. We see, in the Mer du Nord, des centres de production et d'échanges commerciaux qui apparaissent, qu'on appelle souvent des VIC en contexte anglo-saxon, qui entretiennent donc des, des liens commerciaux entre eux. And these uh, collectively provided a hub in northwestern Europe for the exchange of goods across long distances. C'est aussi des centres de production artisanale, donc où différents types d'objets étaient fabriqués, des objets en os, en bois de cervidé, par exemple des peignes. Euh, mais aussi des objets métalliques, des objets de parure euh, en alliage cuivreux, donc en bronze. Varer från Skandinavien och Norden var väldigt eftertraktade nere i Europa. Det var skinn, det var pälsar, det var inlagd fisk säkerligen. Längre norrifrån så kan det ha varit valrosbetar, det var horn och benprodukter, eh, honung förmodligen och kanske mjöd, eh, även om det förmodligen var lite exotiskt. Sen kan man också tänka sig på att 
på de här platserna att det fanns hantverkare som gjorde föremål och sålde på plats. Pärltillverkning är vanligt. Hornhantverk där man har gjort kammar och andra hornredskap. Snickare, tunntillverkning har man säkert gjort, keramikkärl. Dels för att sälja som kärlen som de är men också för att man kan frakta varor i keramikkärlen och i tunnorna. Textilhantverk, massa olika typer av hantverk möttes på de här platserna. Så att det blev också en smältdegel av intryck från hela Europa. Många olika typer av människor. Det fanns säkert värsthus, underhållning, sångare, barder. Förmodligen fanns det bordeller och sen levde det också vanliga människor som levde sina familjeliv på de här platserna. Som ägnade sig åt att syssla med handel. Donc en lien avec euh, ces différentes productions artisanales, il y a un, un besoin de d'avoir accès et de produire des matières premières donc qui sont indispensables euh, à ces productions. Ce qui implique en fait que les réseaux d'échange, ils ne constituent pas seulement des réseaux commerciaux, mais aussi des réseaux de distribution de ces ressources. Et c'est quelque chose qu'on voit bien apparaître en Scandinavie déjà au 8e siècle. Euh, où des euh, matières premières euh, sont importées, par exemple, de Norvège au Danemark pour la fabrication de, de certains objets. Ça veut aussi dire qu'il euh, apparaît donc une, une nouvelle manière euh, d'exploiter les ressources naturelles au-delà de l'agriculture. Donc ça attire aussi euh, des intérêts politiques des élites qui voient euh, dans la possibilité de contrôler l'extraction et la distribution de ces matières premières une possibilité de s'enrichir également. Raiding also gives the Vikings access to another product. One that they buy and sell at various markets. Slavhandel var ju en väldigt viktig marknad där man kunde få tag på både skickliga hantverkare, vackra kvinnor, män som hade kunskaper som man kunde ha nytta av till exempel läskunniga, kanske präster och munkar, som kunde hjälpa en kung eller en hövding att bli mer lärd eller få bättre anseende, och också få kunskaper som de vanliga människorna inte hade. Att ha kunskap som inte är allmänt känt, det är också en källa till makt. Och det kan man få genom att skaffa sig rätt slags slavar med rätt slags kunskap. De här handelsplatserna de var riktiga knutpunkter både för utbyte av varor, av idéer och de har varit maktfästen också som det har varit viktigt att ha kontroll över. I förlängningen så kan man också eh, tänka sig att man har betalat skatt till de som äger de här platserna för att få komma dit och handla. Så måste man betala en skatt eh, för att sätta upp sitt stånd. Och det är också en väldigt bra inkomstkälla då för, en, för en lokal hövding eller en kung att kunna få intäkter från konstanta intäkter från en sån här plats. Visitors to these trading posts are mainly engaged in peaceful trade. And as the buying and selling of various goods increases. The trading posts grow rapidly, as does their political significance. They soon become centers of political power and important strategic points to control. As a result, the conflicts between the Vikings and the Franks flare up once again. In the year 808, the great trading post of Rerik is suddenly attacked by the Danish king Gudfred. Rerik était situé dans une région qui, euh, au 8e siècle euh, et début du 9e siècle, était contrôlée par euh, un peuple slave 
euh, les, les apodrites. Et en fait, dans, en contexte euh, des, des guerres entre les francs carolingiens et les saxons, les apodrites étaient alliés euh, aux carolingiens. De son côté, euh, au Danemark, euh, on a le roi Godfred, qui lui est plutôt euh, associé euh, aux saxons. What we have in Denmark at this time, uh, in, during the reign of Godfred, is an attempt to, by the king to consolidate his power, which is, you know, at least uh, to some extent in relation um, to the increasing and antagonistic contacts uh, between the Danes and, and the Carolingians. Donc, on connaît par, euh, par les sources écrites euh, Franck, qui donc décrit donc, pour cette année là, en 808, donc le, le roi Godfred euh, fait détruire euh, l'Empoium de Rerick. La destruction de Rerik est en, à mettre en lien avec l'expansion franque vers le nord et l'est de, de l'Europe de manière plus générale. Rerik génère des revenus assez importants à travers des taxes. Ça me paraît être un des intérêts, une des motivations du moins, pour Gottfried de faire détruire la ville, puisque si celle-ci était bien contrôlée par les abodrites, c'était un moyen donc, de, d'empêcher donc, ses ennemis Euh, d'avoir un revenu financier euh, intéressant. Sen tog han många av handelsmännen och hantverkarna för det är också så att många hantverkare samlas på de här handelsplatserna och tog med sig dem till gränsen mellan Dan- nu till Danmark och eh, Tyskland i Slistorp och sen eh, installerade han dem på den stora handelsplatsen som växte fram där som heter Heidabu. And there he basically had control over these individuals, and these are craft specialists, specialists in trade. They can bring in a lot of income. Uh, This income can be taxed, and this directly has consequences for for Godfred's power. It also sends a strong message to the Carolingians that Godfred, the the Danish king, is, is a force to be reckoned with, and that he now has the influence and the power to bring you know, elements of this North Sea and Atlantic and Baltic trade uh, under his direct control. He also is recorded as establishing a large linear earthwork in southern Jutland. It's called the Danavirka. A long palisade that was three miles long, which was formed of three Kolar och också diken eh, som har gjort att det ska vara svårt att anfalla den här platsen. In all likelihood, according to the archaeological evidence, this monument was already in existence during Godfrey's reign. So what he probably did was was refortify it. Uh, but nonetheless, that indicates that he must have had um, extensive control, not only over a, a significant uh, pool of resources, but also a pool of labor. So from this we can infer that uh, certainly uh, within Godfred's sphere of power, there was um, certainly a degree of centralized political power allowing him to draw on his various uh, subordinates and, and likely large numbers of the, uh, the general population as well. Donc le Danemark, euh, au début du 9e siècle, donc à l'époque de Godfred, ce n'est pas un territoire unifié. Euh, ce n'est pas le royaume du Danemark comme on le connaît aujourd'hui ou comme on le connaissait aussi euh, au Moyen-Âge, avec euh, des frontières bien définies et un seul roi euh, qui gouverne l'ensemble du territoire. À ce moment-là, en fait, il faut plutôt s'imaginer des, euh, 
des entités politiques régionales euh, dans l'ouest et dans l'est du Danemark qui, euh, qui étaient sans doute assez souvent en conflit euh, entre elles, même si, euh, même si on n'a pas de source évidente euh, pour ça. Ce qu'on voit surtout, en fait, c'est euh, le, les conflits autour de Godfred et des, des prétendants au trône euh, qui, euh, sans doute, étaient concentrés dans la partie ouest du Danemark, dans la partie euh, du Jutland. Naturally, the sacking and destruction of Rerik was a clear provocation of Charlemagne on the part of the Danish king. Peace negotiations were held between the two sides, but in the end they came to nothing. After this, Charlemagne created a permanent garrison north of the river Elbe. He planned to retaliate, and when the Danish king brought hundreds of ships to raid the Frisian coastline, Charlemagne gathered his forces to strike back. Just before the Frankish attack, something happens. Charlemagne is reached by a messenger. Gudfred is dead, killed by one of his own bodyguards. When Gudfred dies in 810, Denmark is torn by severe internal strife, as the Danish elites are drawn into a power struggle for the Danish crown. But the Danish conflicts are nothing compared to what happens when the great Frankish emperor dies. Just four years later, in 814, he had ruled France for 46 years, and during his reign, he created a strong Christian empire, well equipped to deal with the Viking threat. What would happen now when he was gone? After that, Karl the Store had died, so took his son Louis the Frome over, and he had four sons. Och han ville att alla sönerna skulle få en del av kungariket även om de inte fick lika stora delar. Så han försökte dela upp riket mellan sina söner. Eh, och det förstår man ju själv direkt att det ledde till problem. Så när han dog eh, så blir det inbördeskrig mellan de här bröderna som alla vill ha tillgång till tronen och gärna en så stor del av landet som möjligt. Resurserna i Frankrike fokuseras på att slå ihjäl varandra, inte att försvara sig och vara beredd på att det ska komma vikingar utifrån att attackera. L'instabilité qui apparaît sur le continent donc par rapport à la succession après Louis le Pieux, ça ouvre en fait une brèche euh, dans ce système de défense qui était auparavant euh, plutôt bien établi. Donc déjà après la mort de Charlemagne, ce système de défense n'est pas maintenu. Donc avec la, la mort de, de Louis le Pieux et la fragmentation de l'Empire franc, on voit apparaître donc une période d'instabilité en fait, où les territoires donc, sont restructurés. Ce qui veut aussi dire que le, la coordination militaire qui avait marqué euh, les royaumes francs euh, auparavant, surtout sous, sous le règne de Charlemagne, devient nettement moins efficace. Ça veut aussi dire que les élites dans les, dans les trois euh, royaumes francs à ce moment-là euh, doivent aussi redéfinir leur position euh, dans ces territoires-là. Et euh, le, leur centre d'intérêt, en fait, se retourne plutôt euh, vers l'intérieur et sur les négociations donc, entre les, les, euh, les royaumes francs. Et donc, ce que nous avons ici, c'est vraiment un cas parfait de circonstances pour les Viking raiding groupes to um, start not only raiding the coast, but to penetrate much further in land and, and to really start to cause havoc. And that's exactly what we see in the historical record. 
The Carolingians did have a well-developed defensive system in place, which in theory was supposed to um, counter these attacks. The kings had the ability to muster large armies, often at short notice, but at the same time, they're often hampered um, in their ability to do so simply because they cannot always count on the support um, of their magnates. De lokala förstarna kunde alliera sig med vikingarna och få hjälp i inbördeskriget också mot att vikingarna fick slå sig ner och kanske tillbringa vintern eller använda resurser fritt. Vikingarna var ju väldigt flexibla och kunde också fungera som ambassadörer och samarbetspartner på många olika sätt. Fanns det en möjlighet för dem att få en tillgång på något sätt så tog de gärna den. De hade inte så mycket strikta regler på vad man fick göra och inte fick göra när man väl befann sig utomlands på det här sättet. Men de lärde sig väldigt fort att i Frankrike fanns det mycket att hämta. Det fanns många rika städer, det fanns många handelsplatser och det fanns många kyrkor och kloster. While the Franks are occupied with the civil war, the Vikings finally manage to push past their defenses and sail up the great rivers. In search of gold, glory and ultimately land, they advanced deeper into Frankish empire than ever before. Vikingarna var farliga krigare. Om de inte tog slavar och slog ihjäl och plundrade så krävde de ofta att de skulle få betalning för att låta bli att plundra. Och det kunde vara stora mängder silver och guld som de krävde för att lämna en stad eller en kustrems eller så i fred. Och det var nästan ännu bättre sätt att plundra på. Det vill säga man behövde inte ens slåss. Man behövde inte göra någonting utan man behövde bara säga att ge oss pengar så låter vi bli. De här stora utbetalningarna kallas ofta för gäld. Till exempel så finns den stora Danagälden där engelsmännen betalar stora summor silver och guld för att vikingarna ska låta bli och plundra. Och det gör de också ett tag. Det kan vara så att de här gälderna har gjort att de har hållit sig borta ett par år men sen kommer de ofta tillbaka. De här betalar ju. Ja men då åker vi igen. Det var listigt av vikingarna, kanske inte så listigt i längden av de som faktiskt betalade ut de här stora betalningarna till vikingarna. What we're looking at here is is no kind of concerted attempt to extort money or land out of the Carolingians or, or any other uh, societies that uh, the, these groups are coming into violent contact with, but rather these are small groups operating very much within their own interests. I think we need to look at these groups as having their own individual objectives and goals and, and pursuing them in their own ways uh, rather than 
kind of conforming to, to a general strategy um, that may not have actually existed within their own minds. In March 845, a large Danish Viking fleet consisting of 120 ships sails up the River Seine to Paris. The new king, Charles the Bold, had tried fighting the Vikings off with his army, but failed. Paris had a high city wall dating back to Roman times, and the city had several churches inside the wall as well as outside on the beaches of Seine. Two bridges led to the city. On the mainland, these bridges were guarded by tall stone towers. The Vikings organized a siege on the city. The Frankian king, Charles the Bold, was eventually forced to pay a large amount of gold and silver as a ransom for his city. The Vikings followed the floods in Frankrike and formed alliances with local bundsförvanter, with local firsts. Så fick de också möjlighet till att eh, kunna etablera sig på land åtminstone periodvis. Eh, de behövde till exempel inte åka hem över vintrarna. Tidigare så har det varit så att man åker ut på sina färder på våren. Eh, man plundrar och handlar under sommaren och så åker man hem under hösten och tillbringar vintern hemma. Men genom att man faktiskt kunde övervintra och stanna på land under vintern nere i Frankrike så kom man plötsligt i ett helt annat läge. Man kunde börja fortsätta sitt krigande och sin handel tidigare på våren. Och man kunde också börja etablera relationer med de som faktiskt bodde på platsen. Och det här är förmodligen början till det som vi senare ser när vikingarna faktiskt flyttar till andra platser. After the events in Denmark, more and more people traveled from Scandinavia and across the seas to other countries. It's not only armed men in search of gold and glory who make the voyage. They are also families with women and children. And sometimes the journey can be very long. Vikingarna emigrerar ju och flyttar till väldigt många olika delar i Europa. Framförallt norrut på Färöarna, på Island och så småningom också på Grönland. Många landområden tas över eller nyetableras genom vikingarna. De flyttar också till Skottland och till Irland och till England. The Frankish civil war gives the Vikings an opportunity to stay in Francia for considerably longer periods of time. They manage to exploit the unrest for their own gain and are able to remain over the winter in several places in England as well as in the Frankish Empire. But life in exile at winter camp is not easy. The majority of the information we have uh, from the continent at the moment is limited to the historical sources. We know the locations where they were setting up temporary encampments. But archaeologically, at least, it's quite difficult uh, to identify these sites. Where we have had some really good archaeological research done recently is in England. And what we found uh, in England are at least two now um, winter camps. Essentially, when these Viking forces were operating in the field for long periods of time, they would often spend the winter ensconced in some kind of, of temporary encampment.
par exemple, euh, en, sur le continent, on a donc, ces, des campements vikings qui sont installés sur l'île de Noirmoutier, mais aussi sur des îles de la Seine, par exemple euh, Jeufos, donc euh, en aval euh, de Paris. What we're seeing here are groups that are very different uh, to the early Viking raiding fleets. These aren't just a few crews of individuals operating opportunistically, but rather they're very large, uh, comprising perhaps thousands of people, moving around the landscape for long periods of time. Unlike the early raiders who would uh, raid seasonally, these groups were staying out in, in what is now France, in, in England, um, for years and even over decades uh, of time. What we're not really sure about at this time is what these camps physically looked like. What we do see evidence for, though, is their occupation of the site itself, largely uh, through evidence of metal production and manufacturing and, and trade. And the thing about these sites is that they're often detected uh, through the work of metal detectorists. Uh, so we actually have a preponderance of fragments of jewelry, of uh, fragmented coins, uh, bits of uh, silver bullion, which attest to actually quite a large amount of loot being processed at these sites, and also to substantial trade. Donc, au quotidien, euh, la vie sur ces camps, évidemment, c'est une vie euh, assez sommaire. Euh, c'est un habitat euh, temporaire. On ne voit pas de structure euh, en dur, on va dire. On n'a pas de grands bâtiments bien construits. Euh, on s'imagine plutôt, un, comme le nom l'indique, une forme de campement, euh, quelque chose de, de plus sommaire. Det är kallt. Det är fuktigt hela tiden. Även om man tar på sig många lager ylle, vilket de säkerligen gjorde, hade mycket halm i skorna, så frös de hela tiden. Och när man bor i läger på vintern så torkar kläderna aldrig. Filtarna som man har på sig när man sover, de torkar aldrig. Tältdukarna torkar aldrig. Sen om de hade djur med sig, hästar till exempel, så måste hästarna hela tiden ha färsk vatten. Det fanns förmodligen inte mycket till bete, även om det kanske var bättre bete i Frankrike på vintrarna än vad det är i Skandinavien. Det var förmodligen en hel del som dog i de här lägren just för att det var så eh, hårda förhållanden. C'est intéressant du point de vue des sources écrites, c'est qu'on voit aussi que qu'il y avait des femmes et des enfants euh, qui vivaient également euh, avec avec les groupes de Vikings euh, sur ces camps. Alors, qui était-il euh, Est-ce qu'il venait de Scandinavie euh, avec eux Est-ce qu'il faisait partie de de l'armée en mouvement euh, Ou est-ce que c'est des captifs euh, qui ont été pris euh, à l'occasion d'attaques soit pour euh, ensuite être revendu comme esclave, soit pour être gardé euh, comme euh, concubine, ou est-ce que ce sont devenus des, des partenaires euh, à part entière C'est assez difficile à dire.
sur les, les campements euh, qu'il a été possible d'étudier en Angleterre, donc sur la base du, du matériel archéologique, on voit aussi donc, cette impression d'une du, armée en mouvement, donc la, la culture matérielle d'une petite communauté militaire qui se déplace. Donc par exemple, à, à Torxy, donc on a un site d'une taille importante, de plusieurs hectares, où on a un matériel archéologique abondant, donc des, des objets métalliques essentiellement, puisque c'est un site qui a été euh, étudié sur la base d'objets recouverts grâce euh, à l'utilisation des détecteurs de métaux. Et là, on voit donc des activités euh, de production euh, d'objets, mais surtout euh, un aspect aussi commercial. Et donc le site de Torxé, on, on l'associe euh, aux années 870, euh, où la Grande Armée euh, était, euh, était en mouvement euh, sur les territoires anglo-saxons. But one of the thing I find really interesting about these sites is what they mean uh, for our perceptions of the later settlement of the landscape uh, in both England and in the Carolingian Empire. If we're to accept that these large Viking forces were comprised of numerous autonomous groups uh, coming together and acting together uh, for a short period of time, then what we essentially have here is the creation of, although we call them Um, often uh, armies, they're actually kind of mobile societies or polities in their own right. And the conditions in which they're living in these camps uh, might actually provide a kind of precursor for the later settlement of the landscape, both in England and within the Carolingian Empire. Because it might have been the first time that many of these groups were coming together uh, and inhabiting a single area in such a way. After the death of Charlemagne, civil war raged in Francia, and the coastal defenses couldn't be maintained. The area lay open to Scandinavians, searching for gold, glory, and eventually land. Meanwhile, there was also unrest in Denmark. Along with usual adventures, there were now other people in exile, looking for new opportunities abroad. During the 800s, as the Vikings managed to push deeper into Christian Francia, Their tactics changed. They went from pillaging small monasteries to attacking large cities like Paris. A common Viking strategy was to hold a city hostage, forcing them to pay a ransom, usually gold and silver. Despite the turbulence that plagued Francia during this period, the Vikings will not be able to remain. The resistance soon becomes stronger again and the new Frankish emperor manages to rebuild his defenses, including those along the River Seine, preventing further attacks on Paris. During the years that follow, the Vikings will instead turn toward the British Isles. This, however, is only temporary. The Vikings haven't finished with Francia. When they return, they do so with a new goal, to become an integrated part of Frankish society. And in order to achieve this, the Vikings are willing to go to any length.